Chapter 19. Chapter 19. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe, and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man! When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him! For I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king! But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation, that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers, and break the legs of the first, and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bare record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, 
a bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus, and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulchre, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulchre was nigh at hand. All right. So there we go, chapter 19. And as, you, as we had say, stated earlier, that uh, chapter 19 is the the um, the payment, the payment that uh, that we have all talked about, that we, that we looked upon, that everything that was written about. When Jesus said, "It is finished," he basically is saying, "I have paid the price. I have I have lived a perfect life." I have fulfilled every aspect of scripture. And it's interesting because um, even after his, his surrendering of his spirit, there was still some scripture that, that needed to be fulfilled. Even though he said, it is finished. And we'll talk about that in the, uh, as we go through it. And uh, we, we see that they, they, they even acted in the um, uh, predicted and, and uh, foretold manner even after he had given up his spirit. All right, so let's go back to the uh, beginning. Now remember, Pilate now is conf confronting um, Jesus, and he doesn't want to. Pilate is like, you know, I don't want to do this. You know, I don't want to deal with this man. And he tried to get rid of Jesus. He tried to send him over to who? To Herod. Once he found out that Jesus was up in Galilee. Because and, and, Pilate was like, you know, I know how these guys are. I've been ruling over them for a while. And I understand what they're all about. And I know they are, they are all about power and all about prestige and all about position. Pilate was not naive to that. And it's a, it's a sad situation when we think about it because what? That's what we have today. A lot of organizations, a lot of systems, a lot of things are all about power, prestige, money, you know, the ability to control and, and, and to stay in power. And to keep the, the, the control. All of that is kind of like very similar to what we see today. Well, so Pilate's trying to deal with this. And he's trying to make it as comfortable for himself as possible. But he's also trying to be do his job. As the governor of that area, he's trying to be fair. And trying to, to make sure that things are done right. So uh, now Jesus is brought back to him. And in, in, in 19, it starts off by saying, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Now, scourging means he got he got whipped with a whip that had nine uh, uh, lashes, not, uh, not lashes, but, but nine, uh, yeah, it, had, it had nine strings on it, and, it, and I'm using strings, I don't have a, I'm using, not using the right word, but, but within each of those, um, uh, those strings were, and they were leather strings that had glass and, and bits of bone and anything that they could use that would grab flesh and rip it. And um, the idea behind that it is um, as you would get hit with that, that, that whip, if you were guilty, more than likely at some point you would say, okay, because you know you were guilty. And the way they were, and these guys were not somebody they pull off the street and say, okay, go hit this guy in the back. These were professionals. They knew what they were doing. This is what they did. And they knew how to put that thing in your back, and they knew how to pull it so that it would do the most damage. And if you were guilty, you would eventually be like, all right, you know what? And a lot of people didn't survive those scourges. All right? And, um, but you, you see here, as we go through it, he's going to, he's going to, um, uh, well, let's just read it. Verse 2. It says, Then the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it upon his head and put a, on him uh, a purple robe. Now, um, the thing to keep in mind about this, that that thorn 
that was placed upon that bush of thorn that was placed upon his head. It has a lot of significance because when you think about it, um, good morning. When you think about um, the um, the thorns, is there some more chairs up there? Because there's some more in the next in the next room. If we need another one, we get it. Get it. Get it. All right. Taylor's going to get a couple more chairs just in case. All right. But keep in mind, we're in chapter 19. Keep in mind the, um, the thorns, that, that bush. Um, I don't know for sure because I wasn't there, but a lot of the, the historians and scholars say that that bush that was placed upon his head was the same kind of bush that Moses saw when the bush was burning. And it's interesting if you think about that because Mo when Moses saw that bush, he saw the bush on fire. And there's nothing strange about that, a bush being on fire. But what made it unique? It wasn't being, it wasn't work, being consumed. All right? Now what does that tell us? That, that gives us an understanding of what, uh, what it was that attracted Moses. A bush that's on fire is supposed to burn up, but did we are supposed to what? The wages of sin is death. But in Christ we will not suffer that death. That bush was a symbol of God's mercy. You are supposed to burn, but I'm sustaining you and not allowing you to burn. That's mercy. So I'm going to give you life and give you the ability to, to, uh, to exist when the circumstances around you truly say that you're not supposed to. And that was, that, is his, that was the crown they put on him. A crown of his mercy. He was the king of mercy. Right? And it's important for us to keep that in mind. But they played it that, thro that, 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 uh, that, that crown of, of thorns and put it on his head. And trust me, that was not something that you're just going to be like, ooh, I got a little pricker. Those thorns were very, very big, very long, and they sunk them into his skin. And uh, that's not something that um, you just walk around talking about, ouch. It's, that was part of the, the, uh, the scourging. And he's being mocked as well. Because the soldiers, they don't, they don't see him as anything but what? A prisoner. And they're just treating him the way they normally would treat prisoners. They're teasing him, mocking him bullying him, making sport of him, and for them, he's just another day's work. But in reality, he is what? He is the Messiah, Son of God. Now, keep this in mind. Uh, we, we, we see that, and watch as we go through this, what the Jews say. But they're all not. Amazing. Watch what these, the, the, these people will actually say as they are handing him over. All right, so in verse 5, we see that they, they brought, it says, Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Now, you kind of get the feeling, I could be wrong, but I kind of get the feeling that Pilate was thinking, if I had this man beat and whooped and humiliated and made to, to just, and I show him to the people, now look at him. They'd be like, all right, you know what? That's enough. I mean, the man, the man has been, been whipped and humiliated. And, all right, that's, that's good enough. But that wasn't good enough, not for them. They wanted him what? They wanted him crucified. They wanted him dead. But look at what happens in verse, verse 6. It says, And when the chief priest, therefore, and the officers saw him, they cried out, Oh, that's enough. That's, that's good enough. Is that what your Bible said? No. What they say? Crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and crucify him. For I have found what? No fault in him. So Pilate, the governor, 
said, this man has done nothing wrong that I can see. And he's saying, let him, you know, if you want him crucified, you take him and you crucify him. Look at verse 7. The Jews answered him, we, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself who? Son of God. Now wait a minute. See, this is, this is where I don't, I, I'm, I'm having a problem here. See, they know what he's trying to say. They know what he's saying. They know that he is saying that, that I am what? That's what he's been trying to tell them the whole time, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So what's the issue here? If, if he is the son of God, and they are acknowledging the fact that he says he's the son of God, the scripture says that the Messiah is supposed to come, why are they crucifying him? Oh. Oh. He, he didn't do it their way, did he? He did it differently, didn't he? It's, it's, it's a whole lot to be said for for for, for that, that type of mindset. Because we can be guilty of that too. Because we have things and we know how we like things. We know how I think it should be like this. I think it should be like that. And we have to be careful and ask God to show us, Lord, how should it be? which is really, very, very important. Which is why God tells us that we should not be so hung up on the, the traditions of men and of this world too. But don't get so hung up on the traditions of men. Why? Because the traditions of men, a lot of times, will lull you into a sense of comfortable status where you just say, this is the way it's supposed to be. And you have to be careful of that. That's how people get brainwashed. That's how people get conformed. And that's why Paul tells us, don't be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed. And it's important that we recognize that. And so the, the Jewish leaders were guilty. And Jesus is going to tell them, say in a minute, that, that they are more, even more guilty than Pilate is. Because they know. But then because they would have been able to create such a sustainable, consistent way of doing things that even the people are following them. Because that's what they're used to. Their mama did it. Their grandmama did it that way. That's how it was done. And this is the way it's going to be. And it's going to be like this until the end, of, end of time. But it wasn't. Shortly after this, all of those Jewish uh, animal sacrifices ended. Everything changed. Because it was, it was time to change. It was time to make the move, but so locked in, so conformed, so traditionalized that you could not see truth when truth came directly to you. And that's important to keep in mind. That's why you have to be a thinker. You, you got to, and even uh, Paul, when he was talking about the Bereans, he said that they, they try everything that's been said. You have to test, this, test what's being said by what? By the, by the spirit and by the scripture you got to always do that and you have to be careful because a lot of times the, the trend will happen so easily and so happy so, so so cleverly that where everybody just says this is how things are supposed to be and so the Jewish people said that, that you know that he calls himself the son of God but to them that's not the way we wanted him to come to us we want the son of God to come to us this way a certain way and so therefore they consider him to be a blasphemer and want him put to death verse 8 when Pilate therefore heard that saying he was what? more afraid now Pilate had enough sense to be like whoa if this man is talking about he's the son of God and I watched him be watched him scourge and he didn't open up his mouth and he is not naive and nor is he a novice to dealing with people that are criminals but are lying. They know how to, to a certain degree, to get a, a criminal that's saying, I didn't do it, and they really did. They know how to get him to confess. And Pilate watched this man get scourged and didn't open his mouth up one time. 
So Pilate knew there was something different, something unique. That's why Pilate said, this man is not guilty. I find no fault in this man. But then they say, this man makes himself to be a, a god, the son of God. Now Pilate's beginning to think. And he's also, what? Afraid. Because he says, there is something about this man I don't understand. And so he's beginning to think. And now Pilate's got to start weighing stuff. Remember, in the other, in the other uh, Gospels, what did Pilate's wife tell him? Pilate's wife told him to what had nothing to do with this with this just man, because he she had that what that dream. Right? So Pilate, I'm sure, is a little bit concerned as to what is really going on and who is this person standing before me. All right. So. Um, in verse 8, we see the pilot was therefore more afraid. In verse 9, it says, And went again uh, into the judgment hall, and, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? In other words, where are you from? He asked this man, Where are you from? He asked Jesus, Where do you come from? But Jesus gave him what? No answer. No answer. Pilate, you're going you're gonna to have to go by what you know. You are... See, you think that Jesus is being tried? You think that Jesus is on trial here? You know who's really on trial here? Pilate. Pilate and his whole aspect of what? Of governing is on trial. How are you going to govern? Are you going to govern by what you know is right? Or are you going to just cave in to popular opinion and placate and save your own uh, position? See, we're going to see in a minute what, what happens there. Because really, he's fighting against the popular opinion right now, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Right now, he is. He's like, I don't see nothing wrong. They're saying he's guilty. I said, I don't see nothing wrong. And he's telling them, what you're telling me about this man, I don't see it. Which is okay. And, I, and you almost get the pilot, you know, a, 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 a little check in the box. Okay? All right. But let's keep on. Let's see what's actually going to make this man cave in. All right? Verse, uh, verse 11. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Let's go back to verse 10. Then said uh, Pilate unto him, uh, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? So now Pilate, uh, he's amazed. Here's a man that I ask you a question and you don't speak to me. So you don't even recognize that I have authority? I have power? Pilate flexing his muscles. I have power. I could have you crucified or I could have you released. Look at Jesus' answer, verse 11. Jesus answered, Thou could have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Now, let's break this down. He says, First of all, thou could have had no power at all except, uh, no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. So, in reality, what Jesus is saying, you do have the power. He did, he, he, he's acknowledging that. You do have the power, but it's not power in your own strength. This power was given to you. Sometimes we think that, this is why you can't get, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, so boastful and proud over gifts and, and talents and the abilities that God gives you. Some people have a, a ability and some people have maybe lesser ability. But it's all gifts that are given to us from who? From the Lord. So therefore, you didn't, you didn't while, while you were being born, you didn't just go to the, you know, being born store and just select all the gifts and talents you were going to have. You didn't do that. They were what? Given to you. Exactly. God gave those to you. So we can't boast in anything. Any achievement. Any glory. And sometimes that's the problem because we want to be able to compare ourselves. I'm doing better than this one. And I'm doing better than that one. And I'm moving up faster than that one. And I'm achieving more than this person's achieving. And we have to be careful that we, we, we don't, because that, that will get, that will never lead you to true happiness because you're going to always find somebody that's doing better than you. And if that's how you are, you know, chalking up your, your happy, your happy meter, it's going to stay 
low because you always are trying to compare yourself to somebody else instead of just enjoying what God gave you. And if you can enjoy what God gave you, enjoy the blessings, and that's why people, you see people, the man, I tell you, you look on the, on the, on the, uh, the pharmacies and the, and the over-the-counter stuff and the prescription drugs, people are taking more drugs for depression and for, you know, than, than ever before. Now, there's some people, granted, you need it, and I'm not against that. But some of it is because we're viewing things wrong and we're making ourselves upset when we don't have to be. When you really got things going well for yourself and you're doing okay, but you just, I, I'm not doing what this person did. I'm not doing what that was. We used to call that doing what? Keeping up with the Joneses. Up with the Joneses. All right, so let the Joneses go on. And let us do what God has given us to do. So, so he's telling Pilate, don't, you know, don't boast in that. Don't boast in the fact that you got power because it was given to you. All right? Um... Now, and also the thing about it, uh, the Bible says, to whom much is given, what? Much is, much is required. So now Pilate needs to understand. Okay, wait a minute. Jesus just basically affirmed the power to set me free or to crucify me. You do have it. And it was given to you. But guess what? Because it was given to you, you are going to be held accountable for what you do with it. Remember this parable that Jesus gave of the, the, the men with the, the talents? And how, you know, the first two men went and they, they, they worked their talent and gained more. But the one that had one talent, what did he do with it? He buried it. He didn't use it. And he said, you, and Jesus came back and said that that master's called him wicked and unprofitable servant. So you got to use what you got properly. So now here's Pilate. Pilate could have let Jesus go. He said, you know what? I don't see nothing wrong with this man. I'm going to let him go. And that's what he wants. That, and that's where, if you were to stop now at the narrative, you'd kind of think, Pilate's going to probably let this man go. But let's keep reading because there's another little piece that's going to be thrown in it. And then we're going to see what Pilate's true heart is, what his true loyalty is. Let's keep going. Let's find out why Pilate won't let this man go. All right. Verse 12. And from thence Pilate sought to what? To release him. You see that? Pilate made up his mind. I'm going to release this man. I'm going to let him go. But the Jews cried out saying, If thou let this man go, thou art no, not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Ooh. Okay. Now, those Jewish leaders, they are starting to hit Pilate where it really hurts. Because, see, Pilate could care less about what they were thinking about. But now, these Jewish leaders are saying, if you let this man go, you are actually now against Caesar. When it's all come down to it, if we do the org chart, the organizational chart, who is Pilate's boss, top boss? Caesar. Caesar. Yeah. If you don't do this, you are against uh, um, Obama. If you don't do this, you are against the uh, uh, president of the company. If you don't do this, you, so you see what they're doing. They're now hitting him where they really can feel, you know, it's going to be an issue. Look at this. Uh, verse 13. When Pilate therefore heard that scene, he brought Jesus forth and set him down in the judgment seat in a place that is called uh, the pavement. But the Hebrew, uh, All right. So now Pilate basically is saying now, let me sit him down one more time because <laughs> I got to talk to him. I got to find out really what's going on because now they're threatening my what? My position, my job my power. I have authority to crucify you. I have authority to what? Let you go. Pilate was very, very aware of that and he wanted to keep that. That was his one thing in his life. That's what I got. I have that. I worked hard for that. And, and, and I need to keep this. And now these Jews are telling me, these religious leaders are telling me, you know, that me letting you go is going to jeopardize that. 
I need to have another conversation. So they sat down. First, first 14. And it was the preparation of the Passover. All right? Um, which is important to keep in mind. The preparation of the Passover meant that um, they were preparing for um, a day. Um, I won't get, get all into that. But they're preparing for a day um, that had more to do than just a regular Passover. And we'll see that in a minute here. And there's, there's, it's important just to keep in mind that the, the time in which Jesus was crucified was a special uh, Passover. And we talked about that before. I won't get into it now because we'll be here for all, all evening. But it's always important to keep that in mind. With the preparation, where, where, where am I at? 14, thank you. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour which is also important because it's coming up on the time where the new next day is about to begin. All right? And remember, he said that he was going to be in the grave for what? Three days and what? Three nights. All right? And he uh, said unto the Jews, Behold your king. Verse 15. Look at this. But they cried out, Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but who? Caesar. So they're basically saying, We, our allegiance is to Caesar. That's what our allegiance is. Who should their allegiance be to? To God. So you got to be careful. I mean, it can get real easy when you get to the point where you just get so stubborn and so hard that you're going to do it the way that you want to do it. And to the point that when you say, I have no allegiance but to Caesar. Right. And it's important to keep in mind, I think one of the problems that we have today is that everybody has such strong allegiance to a specific thing. I'm a Democrat and I'm a Democrat and I ain't changing nothing. I'm a Republican and I'm a Republican and I ain't changing nothing. In reality, I don't really care if you're Democrat, Republican, or whatever. If you're trying to do what's right, I'm, I'm okay with that. You can call yourself what you want. And I don't understand that Democrats have certain ways and Republicans have certain ways, but I, I'm not really trying to, to latch on to any specific philosophy. But I do want, I do want to be able to find a person that's doing things right. All right? And that's important to keep in mind. All right. All right, we're doing pretty good. I wasn't sure whether we were going to finish this. We still may not, but let's see what we can do. All right, let's take a look. Verse 16. It says, Then delivered he him, uh, therefore, unto uh, them to be what? To be crucified. Wait a minute. Let's go back up. Let's go back up. Didn't Pilate just say that he had said in his heart that he was going to do what? Look at verse 12. It says, it says and from hence, therefore, Pilate sought to release him. Wait a minute. What happened here? They hit him with the fact that you're going, we're going to report you to Caesar. You let this man go free, and we're going to tell Caesar that you let a man go that made himself a king, and there should be no king but Caesar. You see how they sold out? Pretty sad situation here. All right. So we see now that a quick turn of events here. But now, keep in mind, let's look at Pilate here. He had the authority to do what? But he didn't. Sometimes when you have the authority to do right, but you don't do it, it's important to keep that in mind. All right? Look at verse 18. Wherefore, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, not, not the, uh, 17. It says, and he, um, Actually, let's go back and I'm going to read 16 again because we want to read 16 and 17 together. It says, Then therefore he, the, uh, 
uh, he therefore unto them to be crucified and took Jesus and led him away. Verse 17. And he and he bared his cross and went forth unto the place uh, called the place of the skull, which is also called in the Hebrew tongue Golgotha. All right. Verse 18. Where they crucified him and two others with him on either one on uh, either side. Jesus in the middle. Verse 19. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. Uh, and wrote um, the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Verse 20. This title then read many of the Jews. For the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh unto the city. And it was written in Hebrew and in Greek and in Latin. All right. And look at verse 21. Then the chief priests of the, of the Jews, uh, they went to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Verse 22, Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. All right. Now, what is this all about? Well, we see here, a lot of, all of a sudden, a lot of stuff just transpired. And John kind of uh, uh, puts this uh, specific portion in a nutshell. But we know a lot of stuff happens. We know that Jesus is carrying the cross. Um, we, we know that from another gospel that uh, at, at one point in time while he's carrying the cross, that uh, uh, the weight of the cross is uh, too much for him. And then they get another person by the name of Simon to help carry the cross. And he's going up uh, uh, this way, up to be crucified. And as this is all going on, and they're seeing him, you know, the nails are being put in his hands and in his foot, uh, uh, and he's being lifted up, and then they're nailing this title on the cross. Now, uh, Pilate is ashamed of himself, I think, to one degree, but also he is trying to preserve his what? Position. But he's also trying to say, well, you know what, I'm going to just make this statement that I feel should go over him. Because usually what they would do on top of the cross, they would put up there what you had done wrong. If you were a murderer, they would put, you know, a murderer on They might put a little details or whatever, but they'd have a description as to why you were hanging here. And that was supposed to be a deterrent to everybody else. So if you saw, you know, this person you know, uh, uh, did this and that, then when you walked across and you saw that, I don't want to be like this person, so I'm not going to do this or that. Pilate wrote on his, uh, on, on, on his um, um, uh, writing above the cross, the king of the Jews. Because that's truly what Pilate believed. But, you see, you can't just some. There's some people that say, "Well, you know what? I know Jesus is the Son of God, but I'm not ready to turn my life around for that." You see that? There's a lot of people like Pilate. They know Jesus is who he say he is. Jesus, the Spirit of God, convinces them, but they don't make a change in life. Pilate did not change. He didn't have enough confidence in Jesus, the Son of, uh, the Son of God, or Jesus, the King of the Jews, to say that it's going to help me at all. He's going to help me keep my job? Maybe not. Maybe you still would have you would have lost your job. We know through history that ended, Pilate ended up dead, whether he was put to death or whether he committed suicide. Scholars debate. Uh, I don't know. I wasn't there. I just know that he still didn't end up with a glorious ending anyway. But the reality of it is, he really did believe Jesus, but he didn't act on it. He didn't make it change his life. There's a lot of people that believe Jesus, but they do not allow it to change their life. And that's what James gets into. When we study the book of James, we'll see. Because James talks about a lot of people that, he said, even the devils believe. And they tremble. But that don't mean anything. You have to actually have what? Fruit. You've got to have fruit. And you're only going to have fruit by being connected to the vine. You have to be personally connected to the Lord. Personal relationship is the way that's a lot of times described. And if you don't have that, you're not going to change. You're going to be just who you are. It's important. So you can't just be like, because what Pilate did, was, it's really sad. 
Now, whether he actually, at some point, because some scholars talk about it, that they wouldn't be surprised if they get to heaven and see Pilate there. I don't know. I, I, I can't go either way on that. But I just know, but what the, in the scripture, what we see right here is that he knew Jesus was who he said he was. And still he didn't act properly on it. He still did what he thought would save his job and his position and his power and not to do what he really knew what was right, which is a sad thing. But we see that a lot today. All right. So, um, and then 22, 23, it says, uh, then the soldiers, um, when they had crucified Jesus, all right, so they already nailed him up on the cross, took his garment and made four parts to every soldier a part. So they, they took his uh, his first outer garment and they cut it up into four parts and gave each soldier a part. And that's one of the ways that the soldiers, you know, you look at uh, certain jobs, they had certain perks. You know, waitress, they, they get paid for waitressing, but then they also get what? Tips. Well, the soldiers, you know, they got paid by the Roman government, but then when they saw a, a person that was being crucified and they had on certain parts of clothes or had something, they were like, oh, well, we can take this and we're going to take this. And they, they would basically just scavenge whatever the criminal had uh, when they were being crucified. And they would just take it. And that was just how, they, how business was run. And so they looked at Jesus, and once again, to them, they're just looking at him as another, another criminal. And they're just doing their job. And sometimes you've got to be careful that you just don't be just doing your job. You need to know why you do your job, and what your job is all about, and what's going on. And a lot of times that takes being aware, being, being caught up in current affairs. And you young folks, y'all need to be aware of this, because y'all living in times, I don't, even know, I don't even know how to explain it. I don't, I don't know how to explain it, because things are going to be so deceitful, and things are going to look so wonderful, but they're not. And you cannot let people just tell you anything. I may be dead and gone, but y'all need to always remember that man that used to sit there with them, that computer and that Bible always said, don't believe everything that they tell you. Do your own investigation. Y'all you know, gonna have families and children, you know, and, and, you know, I don't know, I just know that it's coming. This great deception. But yet we see it happening now. People calling things all kinds of ways, trying to get you to believe. And it's funny how, you know, we even talk, they even talk about, you know, having openness and, and freedom. But then if you don't believe like they believe, you are ostracized. You are put into a, uh, uh, a place of just being totally criticized. So you have to be careful because they don't, they, they'll say one thing but totally mean another. They don't want you to have the ability to choose and to have freedom and, and, and have, you know, be whoever you want to be. Because if you choose to be a Christian that believes that that Christ is the only way, but well, I just choose to believe that. That's what I believe. They're going to be upset with you and say, you can't believe that. you got to believe something that allows everybody to be wonderful in your mind. Everybody's belief has to be wonderful in your mind. And we can't be against anyone. Then they're going to call it that you are feeling in hate because you think you're the only one that can make it to heaven. And it's like, no, I'm not the only one. Anybody can make it. But you got to come through Jesus. And so you can see that, and, and the tip of the iceberg is showing through. I can see it now. I'm sure a lot of you can see it. But what's coming behind that? And they're already oppressing religion. And just because they're not oppressing in, in America so hard, they are, they are doing it, Christianity. They're doing it very subtly. But the, the, uh, the religion that's really being attacked right now is um, uh, radical Islam. And we understand why. But what does that do? It gets you to what? To be comfortable with being against certain forms of thought. And to the point to where now when you go in the airport, you hear, you know, if, if you see something, report it. You go in the train station, if you see something, do what? Report it. See? And so we're getting to a point where everyone is going to be trained to tell on other people. But that's it's not new. It was like that in Nazi Germany, too. Right? And we, we do know that the Bible tells us that uh, the mother will 
will tell on the, the daughter, and the daughter will tell on the mother. The father will be against the son, and the son against the father. That's prophesied in the Bible. Well, you think, well, what are, what are they talking about? Well, just this. So when a child decides, I want to believe in Jesus, and the mother like, you ain't going to believe in Jesus and live in here. I'm going to report you to the hate crime. people do that, you know? And, and I'm, I'm creating scenarios, and I'm not quite sure how it's going to pan out. But what I'm trying to say is keep your eyes open. All right? Because what I'm saying to you may not be exactly how it happens, but it will be something like that. But the scriptures already told us these things are going to happen. And we see it starting. It's coming now. And so we got young folks and children and babies. We got to let them know. You know. Keep your eyes open. Keep your ears open. Do your own research. Don't listen to everything. And please, don't pay attention to everything you see on, on mainstream news. Because that ain't the news. That's the brainwashing. That's the, you know. and Because they're only going to allow to get through what they want to get through. Then you say, no, nah, he sound like a conspiracy theory. No, no. I'm just saying, you just have to not swallow all that you hear on popular newscasts. But you do got to watch and play. A lot of good stuff is out there. Sometimes you got to dig for it. There's some things, but, you know, unfortunately, when you dig for it, you're going to find some very sound things. You're also going to find some very wacky things, too. <laughs> That's why you got to play. <laughs> That's why you, it ain't just going out there and searching and watching. You do. You do got to pray to ask God to give you some guidance. All right, enough of that. I went off on a tangent on that, but I think it's important <laughs> that we, we, uh, we keep that in mind. So the soldiers, they, they fight, I mean, they, they uh, divide the garments, all right? It says, um, uh, and then the, the second part of verse 23, it says, and also his coat, all right? Now, uh, the coat was without seam, woven from uh, top uh, and throughout. So he had another garment that was of one, one single tapestry. It was a, see, it wasn't something that we had different pieces that were sewn together. It was all one piece, and they decided. And look what they uh, say here, verse twenty-four. Then said therefore among themselves, Let us not rend it. Let us cast lots for it, for whose it shall be, that the scriptures may be fulfilled. Now that they're fulfilling scripture, do they know they're fulfilling scripture? No. no. Yeah. So they they're gonna cast lots for this. So the scriptures will be fulfilled, which uh, said, they they parted my raiment among them. All right, that was the other raiment, right? That they did what? They cut into what? Four pieces. And for my vesture, they did what? Cast lot. All right. And so we can see a, um, a lot of this. And one of the things that I think is important, and what we may do on uh, next uh, next week is just, or, or really just do for homework, homework. Read Psalms 22 and Isaiah 53. Psalms 22 and Isaiah 53. You're going to see, you're going to be like, well, wait a minute. This is exactly what, was, what happened to, uh, to Jesus while he was on the cross. Right. Psalms 22 and Isaiah 53. Read those uh, those um, portions of scriptures, and you'll see a, a whole lot of what was going on because they it really prophesies the true goings on. Even sometimes more detail is in those two scriptures than even what we see in the gospel because that was given by the Spirit. All right, so let's move along here. All right, so. Um, Verse 25, it says, Now there stood by the cross Jesus, uh, his mother, and uh, his mother's sister, Mary, and the Mary, and, and uh, Mary, the, the wife of Cleophas, and uh, Mary uh, Magdalene. Verse 26, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by, he, uh, whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Behold thy son. <coughs> 
verse 27. Then said he unto the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her unto his own home. Now, what does this say? It's, And so we see here that uh, it's, what's interesting is that John, uh, as a disciple of Jesus, is entrusted with uh, the care of Jesus' mother. Now, um, what does, so what does this tell us? Because it tells us a couple of things. Well, first of all, you'd say to yourself, well, where's, where's Joseph? Who's Joseph? Joseph is Mary, was Mary's what? Husband. So where, where's Joseph at? Does it say? More than likely, because of the, because of his absence, you have to believe that he probably died. I mean, or something happened the way he he left the family. We don't know. The best guesstimate would be that he probably had died. And what about uh, Jesus' brothers and sisters? Well, Jesus entrusted to him his mother's care to someone that he knew was following what his teaching even though Jesus had other brothers and sisters. But we do know that, his bro that, that uh, uh, at least two of his brothers do believe in him after his resurrection. Who are those two brothers? James. Jude. James and Jude. All right. And so... <laughs> and so it's important... <laughs> <laughs> it's important to keep in mind that Jesus valued the relationship of, of of my relationship with the Father and your relationship with the Father as closer than blood relationship, right. which is very important to keep in mind. All right. So then, in verse twenty-eight, it says. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Right? Because once again, he is fulfilling more, uh, more scripture. It says, and uh, now therefore there was set a vestibule full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with the vinegar, and put it upon uh, a, a hyssop, and uh, put it to his mouth. Verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he, he said, what? It is finished. And bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Right? And this is where he allowed himself to die. Because he said, no man does what? Take my life. I do what? I lay it down. So this is where he allowed himself to, 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 de to decease. All right? Verse 31, it says, And the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation uh, that the body should not uh, remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. Now look at this. For that Sabbath day was a high day. See, so it wasn't an ordinary Sabbath day. And we had talked about it before where... You had the the um, the Passover followed by the uh, uh, the festival of unleavened bread, uh, and then followed by the actual day of Passover. So you saying that there is a high Sabbath? There was yes. This was a this was a high Sabbath day. This was one of the reasons why they had a preparation day because there were multiple occurrences happening. It just so happened that at this particular time you had this. Uh, combination of of the Passover, which is always followed by the festival of un, of uh, unleavened bread, and then followed by the uh, the regular Sabbath. So those were very high days, and that's what made the day that that time that he was crucified a special a special uh, Passover. All right, and it's the high Sabbath. 
Well, it's 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 one of the festivals. Which festival? The um, Passover. Mm -hmm. It's a seven. It's a seven. It's a seven. I made a feast every year. Mm -hmm. like, we, we've been doing before this feast of tabernacles, feast of trumpets, mm -hmm. uh, bread, what? first fruits. Yeah, so there's supper, first tabernacles. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there's a there's a if, so well what happens is some of them fall on a regular day, like your your regular Sabbath falls on a Saturday all the time. Right. But then the uh, the the, 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 the feast of Passover would fall on a different day, but it would always be the uh, 14th day of Nisan, and, and then, right, there was a real high, real, real high day. No, this is all this is all part of the Jewish religion. Yeah. And so when it all fell fall together, it was important to keep in mind that. Um, all right. All right. And you know what? We we uh, we're, we're not we're not gonna. I thought we were gonna finish, but we're not because it's already after twelve. But I tell you what we're gonna do for next week. Go ahead and do the uh, check out Psalms twenty two and Isaiah fifty three. And what we'll do next week, we'll we'll include those, and then we'll finish this up. And this way we'll have it we'll have it all together. That way we don't go past our time. All right. So I think it's important, though, that we understand. And actually, that's, that's probably...